Well, to talk more about how NGOs can almost play the part of lobbyists and why the U.S. seems to insist on intervening abroad instead of focusing on its own budget woes, I'm joined now by Middle East analyst Ahmed Fatsi. Welcome to the show, Ahmed. Um, so uh, talk Thank a little you, bit more about the role of NGOs and the role that they play in shaping the way people view events. Hi there. Uh, I'm just going to repeat that. I was asking you, um, you know, uh, going along with the, the story there, um, talk about the role in which NGOs can play in shaping the way in which people view world events. NGO have a very uh, critical role in that, especially if they are operating in uh, under totalitarian regimes like in Libya, as the story highlighted. Uh, if we look backward a little bit, uh, I'll take Libya as, uh, as an example. Uh, the, the Libyan uh, people and the Libyan government itself does not allow any NGOs, whether they are locally funded or uh, internationally funded, to operate under any circumstances. So the experience itself is new. If we want to uh, achieve transformation of a country like Libya or elsewhere, we have to rely on the NGOs uh, and rather than uh, relying on government agencies. Consider it as an outsourcing of some uh, tasks that they have to do, especially in the area of uh, uh, creating a, a, an environment where uh, education and uh, educating the population about democracy, freedoms, and human rights. So they have a very important and critical role to play in that area. And uh, NGOs can play a very important and critical role, um, as we just saw in that report there. Um, it's when it came to Libya, for example, some of the reports, though, they turned out to be um, exaggerated or one-sided, or maybe they, they, they don't always um, reveal the full picture. Um, Ed, to what extent are NGOs held accountable for the information that they put out? They should be held accountable uh, since we are going to empower them. Uh, we, we expect as the public that to receive credible, uh, non-biased information. Uh, if their reports will actually cause collateral damage, then they would be considered accomplice uh, in that uh, tragedy if it, if it happens. Uh, so the, the accountability is an important factor as well as transparency, uh, not uh, on the uh, donor side and on the receiver uh, recipient side. It's interesting how you use that word um, accomplice there. Um, Ahmed, uh, they, are, they should be used for a force of good, NGOs, but um, how can they also be used as a tool to support a government's agenda? Uh, that's, that's a very uh, difficult question, Liz, but I'll try uh, to my best ability to answer. Uh, we, we have uh, reviewed that they can be used in good to, to uh, promote uh, values of freedoms, human rights, and democracy. And also, they can work on the social uh, front. But uh, if we uh, allow them to operate without an oversight, then we are just giving them a blank check or your ATM card with your PIN code without any uh, control. So that is the danger there because um, NGOs can, as we've seen, play a very big part in shaping foreign policy. I agree, but one rotten apple does not mean that the whole batch is rotten. We just have to separate. Uh, there might be some uh, uh, not adhering to an ethical standard, first of all, uh, in the sake of uh, gaining financial uh, benefit. But uh, we have to, to review it and we have to uh, institute a, a track record for each of these organizations so we can monitor it. Uh, and then uh, for those who have proven to be bad apples, we have to segregate uh, them and if possible to eliminate them or cut fundings uh, to their activities. Uh, and I agree with you there. Certainly one bad apple doesn't mean that they're 
all bad, and perhaps the answer is more oversight or more regulation. Um, but Ahmed, oftentimes in politics, it, it comes down to money. And when you see so much money being pumped into influencing governments abroad, uh, it begs the question how and why do these agencies continue to spend money on foreign affairs at a time that the U.S. is trying to cut down its own budget um, and dealing with so many problems of our own here at home? Nothing can uh, happen uh, or any of the activities can take place uh, without financial backing. If uh, the countries that these NGOs operate uh, inside them were uh, courageous enough to allow them to operate, set rules and regulations and uh, measures for transparency in terms of the financing they receive, the projects they, they, take, they undertake, and the outcome at the end. Uh, Libya did not have any type of uh, freedom of expression, did not have any type of uh, democratic organization or a democratic culture, a culture of democracy. Uh, so it was difficult. So if the uh, international NGOs decide to use a local uh, organization to undertake, uh, sometimes uh, their choice is not an optimal uh, choice, uh, as we have seen uh, prior. But this, if we are speaking about transparency, I'll, if I can use an example with the uh, religious fundamentalist uh, groups that's prevalent throughout the Middle East, and they, they are reputed to be receiving millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, financing from the rich oil states, with absolutely no oversight and no transparency on either side. This also presents a dilemma for any uh, public worker or uh, for any uh, political activist. One rotten apple does not mean the whole batch is rotten. All right, Ahmed. Um, thank you very much for weighing in on this. That was Middle East analyst Ahmed Fanti.